In this episode of Cycling Tours, I will explore the cycling network within the northern sector of Burdok. Hi fellow viewers, Transit Evolution here, and I will kickstart this video by pushing my bicycle from this exit of Burdok MRT Station, past Burdok Mall. The mall forms a part of the town centre of Burdok and is perpetually busy with high pedestrian volumes throughout the day, since the many public transport commuters have to walk through a part of this sheltered plaza to transfer between the train and the plethora of bus services at the bus stop or interchange. Unfortunately, this makes this part of New Upper Changi Road a very inconvenient route for intertown cyclists, although it is the most direct east-west through route for Burdo. Once I approach the Burdo Beacon Public Housing Precinct though, I can ride on the bicycle again, and with that, I will now head to the outdoor play corridor. Just as a heads up, we will be in for an extremely long video today, on a 22km cycling route that will cover all cycling paths north of New Upper Changi Road, east of the Chai Chi Estate and west of Sungai Bedok, within the sprawling new town of Bedok. In other words, the Bedok Reservoir and Bedok North subzones. Hopefully, this will give you a good picture of the cycling infrastructure here. This is the Outdoor Play Corridor, a shared path by the National Parks Board which links the Bedok Reservoir Park with the East Coast Park. It was announced under the Remaking Our Heartlands program for the area of East Coast back in 2015. This stretch of the path has since been rebuilt due to road widening works along Bedok North Avenue 1. We will have a look at the rest of the Play Corridor later, but for now, we will systematically look through the bulk of the cycling paths in Bedok. I will begin with a slight path diversion along Bedok North Avenue 2 from a shared path which should be reopened by now. Unlike some other parts of Bedok, the cycling path is closer to the road than the footpath here, as is typical in new path projects in Singapore. The bus stop bypass is questionably narrow, but I suppose that's just what you will have to expect for cycling paths built during its time. Just as some construction trivia, the cycling path network here was built under contract TR127, awarded in 2015 at a cost of about $9.6 million by the same contractor involved with Jurong Lake Cycling Town. Just like the Play Corridor, the cycling path network was also announced as part of the Remaking Our Heartlands initiative. While originally intended for completion in the first half of 2017, like many cycling infrastructure projects in Singapore, it got delayed. But the 13km network was eventually completed in January 2018. The cycle paths are painted using the now ubiquitous red paint to distinguish them from foot paths, making it the second town with red instead of grey paths after Ang Mo Kyo. However, there were many strange quirks in the way the paths were designed in this town. Where bus stop bypasses exist, they were often pretty narrow. Hence, there have since been attempts to refine such parts of the network for a smoother experience on active mobility devices, such as ongoing works to reconstruct many bus stops like this one along the way. 
Still, some issues remain, which I will point out throughout this video. For example, I will be making a U-turn at this junction with Bedok North Street 3, next to the Golden Oaks Precinct, as there are no curb cuts at this informal crossing. This is an accessibility issue for wheelchair users, and makes the journey from residential blocks up ahead and to my left, and the neighbourhood centre consisting of 509 to 511 Bedok North Street 3 next to me, much more of a hassle. Of course, I also have to U-turn for the sake of coherence, to travel on the cycling path along the entire stretch of Bedok North Street 3. It's worth noting that there's a section where the cycling path bizarrely disappears along the eastern end of the street though. Another interesting thing about this street is that it is one of the oldest silver zones in Singapore, dating back to 2015. Previously, the roadway to my left would have been a two-lane, one-way street the whole way through, but now it narrows to one lane along certain stretches, enabling easier pedestrian crossings. Alas, green fences have also been installed to impede them, and little thought was given to provide easier pedestrian crossings near the roundabouts which makes it quite a noticeable barrier for pedestrians. The shared path isn't continuous either, as is typical in Singapore, so cyclists and pedestrians will have to give way to vehicles all the time. Over here, I find it puzzling that the pillars supporting this sheltered lingway are placed quite far into the path, which makes cycling through this stretch of the path a little difficult. But once the covered walkway ends, things return to normal. Up ahead, you see 531 Bedok North Street 3, one of quite a few blocks fronting the streetscape with commercial shops on the first story. Many of these blocks contain food courts or coffee shops, known locally as kopitiams. In the heartlands, this would be the Singaporean version of alfresco dining. I shall make a road crossing through this raised zebra crossing here. Thank goodness they remembered to install this for this roundabout. This is to get to the footpath on the opposite side, which should at any time now suddenly turn into a cycling path placed wrongly when compared to the footpath. Perhaps this is to better serve a different neighbourhood centre, comprising 537 to 539 Bedok North Street 3. I do find it interesting that this neighbourhood centre and the one we saw earlier both have block numbers starting with a 5 as it is unusual for a neighbourhood to have two centres under the neighbourhood principle which this town is built on. Here, I will overshoot the zebra crossing just to travel on this stretch of the cycling path that ends abruptly. Well, technically, it joins the outdoor play corridor. But now it's not the time for that, as we should have a look at Bedok North Road, where I will take the time to describe the history of this new town. At the time when Bedok was built, it was described as the fifth new town in Singapore, conceptualized after Queenstown, Topayo, Teluk Blanga, and Stage 1 of Woodlands and around the same time as the Marine Parade and Kalang Basin Estates. Together with Ang Mo Kio and Clementi, they will be developed throughout the 1970s under the third and fourth five-year building program. This new town is pretty huge, 
and its original form covers an area of 800 acres with plans for a population of between 120 and 150,000. This population was intended to be distributed over 500 acres of public housing with 30,000 units at a lower density of 60 units per acre compared to the 80 to 100 units per acre in older towns. Note that I'm speaking in terms of acres instead of hectares as the town was designed before Singapore adopted the metric system. But the point is, there is a low density for public housing in Singapore, even though many of the lengthy and straight slab blocks here rise to a height of 16 storeys. The result is greater spacing between various housing blocks and the street, sometimes filled with greenery and at other times sprawling parking lots at the ground level. With most housing blocks here built to have their facades oriented in the north-south direction, the long slab blocks with lengthy corridors, such as 502 and 503 Badook North Street 3 to my left, do unfortunately make for a more boring walk along the roadways that span the east-west direction. This is occasionally punctuated by a cluster of two or three 25-storey point blocks, like 505 and 506 Badook North Avenue 3. The problem with this is that the same block and flat designs are used across many towns of its time, in a similar manner all across Singapore, be it Ang Mo Kio, Clementi, or Teluk Blanga. To an untrained eye, this could have just been anywhere in Singapore, and it makes for a built environment without a sense of local identity back in the day, which the housing board was often criticised about. Crossing Badook North Avenue 4, the cycling path mysteriously swaps position with the footpath as I approach what may be considered the centre of Feng Shan, 84-89 Badook North Street 4. It is the neighbourhood centre of Badook Neighbourhood 3, although it does not have a tree as a prefix in this block numbering. As it turns out, the block numbering situation in Badook is a little weird, with half the town comprising of neighbourhoods 1, 2 and 3 having block numbers running in sequential order or those in neighbourhoods 4 to 7 have block numbers prefixed by the neighbourhood number. This is perhaps caused by an abrupt transition in the block numbering system sometime in 1978. Speaking of transitions, Bedo experienced another transition one year earlier in 1977, much to the annoyance of its earliest residents, as it caused great inconveniences to thousands of residents, who had to notify their friends and relatives of their address change and replace their identity cards. The road I am on, Badook North Road, was renamed from its original name, Badook Drive. This was done by the Street Names Committee, with the hope that dividing Badook into a North and South section would have resulted in an easier naming system. I will therefore point out the road names which have been altered in 1977 as I continue my journey traversing the cycling paths around Badook New Town.
The construction work for a new platform at Tanamera Station resulted in path diversion works at this intersection. Therefore, to continue onto the cycling path along New Upper Changi Road, I have to skirt around the old Bedok Sports Complex, inclusive of a running track and field, and a sports hall. Previously, there also used to be a swimming complex with competition, teaching, wading, and learners' pools, but it has since been demolished. The sprawling plot of land dedicated to leisure and sports was due to the town centre being envisioned as the major shopping and recreational centre for an East Coast corridor, as it is known in the 1970s. This generous provision of land for a sprawling town centre was likely caused by lessons learned from Queenstown, which had to extend its town centre twice due to it being way too small. Today though, these facilities are gradually getting relocated into community hubs within the town centre to free up land for new housing and parks. I will pass by the one for Bedok later in the video. As the path diversion ends, I bizarrely find myself merging into a cycling path obstructed from the roadway to my left by barricades. Unless you travel the route I took, you would think it leads to nowhere. But before long, I will have to make a right turn into Bedok North Avenue 3, which originally went by the name of Bedok Place. You can sense how sprawling the land dedicated to recreation in this town was. The former swimming complex would sit on this barricaded plot of land to my right. And the land dedicated to shopping is pretty immense too. The town centre would begin left across the street. Over here, the faded markings on the solid path suddenly become sharp and pristine, an example of a recently completed pedestrian priority zone, making journeys on bikes smoother. But what lies ahead is quite hostile to those outside of a car. First, we have a pedestrian overhead bridge without lifts across a four-lane road, a road which doesn't have to be so difficult to cross. Second, northbound vehicles can make a right turn through this uncontrolled junction, exercising discretion to avoid oncoming southbound traffic when doing so. This makes things a little dangerous for pedestrians and cyclists on the informal crossing across Bedok North Street too, as drivers may not be looking out for those who are already crossing midway. Ideally, it will be safer and more pleasant for those on foot if the overhead bridge is removed and the uncontrolled junction is converted into, at the very least, a signalised intersection with crossings on all legs. Once again passing that neighbourhood centre in Fengshan, I am now travelling on a cycling path along Bedok North Avenue 4. In this case, it would have been desirable to push the cycling path closer to the road, which would enlarge the pedestrian realm and blur the border between where people can mingle and where they can walk. Instead, by running the red path like this, we divide the footpath from the plaza to my right, fragmenting quality spaces, which could have been better enjoyed by those on foot. We will encounter more recently built bus stop bypasses along the street, which is great. Such little iterative design changes go a long way in improving the user experience of those cycling and taking transit. In the meantime though, my journey shall continue along this street, where the path will regularly switch between a shed and segregated typology, depending on whether the designers involved were able to find the required width along the way. Here, I cross Sungai Bedok, where I technically leave Bedok and enter Tampanese planning area. Sungai Bedok forms the dividing line between the residential and industrial parts of Bedok, 
and the shed path currently does extend a little into this industrial realm, which I will show you right now. Here, it connects to the Bedok Park connector which we will have a look at later, but the shed path switches to the other side of the road, running along a humongous industrial complex, the JTC Bedok Food City. I will now rewind into the heart of Bedok in preparation for the next street to be covered in this video, Bedok North Street 2. Bedok North Street 2 is a narrower two-lane street. Oh, by narrow, I mean the number of lanes and not the lane width. Because although it's a residential street meant for only local access traffic at slower speeds, this roadway has lanes with a humongous width of 5.8 meters, which is practically wide enough to fit two cars side by side. That's forgiving of a design for a car, and you could theoretically speed through this at speeds unbefitting for a neighborhood street. For context, a typical road lane in Singapore is between 3 and 3.7 meters wide. Such is the typical design of a public housing neighborhood street in the 1970s, as the goal then is to provide ample room for illegal parking or vehicular breakdown. They are not commonly seen today because the other streets that are like this who have encountered road diets under the silver zone scheme by now, but it sure seems to me that this particular street seems to have escaped unnoticed. Some bought 30 Cisco officer looking to hit their quota could therefore just camp here and find e-bike and PMD riders who are legally supposed to dismount and push on footpaths. Fortunately, there are already plans to close such gaps in the cycling network shortly under future contracts for cycling infrastructure. However, that will also mean that this video will not provide an updated look at Bedok cycling infrastructure for long. I shall make a U-turn at Bedok North Avenue 3 from the shed path on its east to the cycling path to its west. Indeed, this avenue is one of the rare ones in this town which features a bi-directional cycling path on both sides. This is ideal because the right roads and streets that we see in our new towns tend to form significant borders that are not immediately crossable, which naturally results in bikes travelling in both directions of the paths along both sides of the road. Admittedly, having bi-directional cycling paths that are this narrow may lead to pretty awkward situations at times on the pavement. Those travelling in the opposite direction will likely pass you too closely. However, it also occasionally results in serendipitous situations near signalised intersections. In this case, I can effortlessly make a right turn into Bedok North Street 1 without waiting since I bypassed the traffic lights. How cool is that? After passing a bus stop where work is finishing up to build a bypass for bikes, I pass Heartbeat at Bedok on my left, the second integrated community hub in Singapore after the one in Tampines. It opened in 2018 and contains a sports centre, public library, community club, polyclinic and senior care centre under one roof. The sports centre contains swimming pools relocated from the site I mentioned earlier, together with a gym tennis courts and badminton courts, replacing the open-air courts that once sat at this site. Passing the town centre of Burdok, 
I'd like to point out that one thing unique about this place is that, together with the neighborhood center of Khatib in Yishun, the pedestrian malls within them are pedestrian-only zones, where riding any sort of active mobility devices within the premises is illegal. The zones are demarcated by red triangles pointing to the no-riding zones and were officially implemented in September 2020. This wasn't a new issue in Bedok, however, as cyclists were fined by the East Coast Town Council as early as 2014 for cycling within the crowded walkways of the town centre. Of course, people still do that nowadays despite the risk of punishment, because many of the destinations which one would bike to are within the town centre. It is also the only direct way for much of Bedok to get to new Upper Changi Road too. So rather than finding people and wishing futilely that the problem would go away, it may sometimes be better to accommodate the needs of the riders by running a segregated cycling path through it, akin to a bicycle street. At this point, I shall return to the outdoor play corridor, where I will make a northward journey to Bedok Reservoir Park. This corridor runs on the west side of Bedok North Avenue 1, formerly known as Bedok Plain, in the early years of this new town. I will have to take care to slow down and carefully navigate around passengers boarding or alighting from the buses at this bus stop, since the bus stop bypass does not exist. Being a shared path, it isn't really that wide for what is supposedly a trunk route for commuters cycling to get between places within the town, but cyclable it is. Passing the Bedok North Vale Housing Precinct, I will take this time to explain why this path goes by the strange name of a play corridor. And that's because the play corridor is not merely a shared path. Activity nodes with play equipment are located along the way. They are consolidated into distinctive totems, such as the one next to this neighborhood center on the west side of neighborhood 5. Crossing Bedok North Street 3 though, the play corridor starts to appear less obvious. I will have to go up this wheelchair ramp and travel through a sprawling open-air car park, as is typical of new towns of its time. Passing 532 Bedok North Street 3, the cyclable part of the play corridor gets rudely interrupted by a pedestrian overhead bridge across the Penn Island Expressway. And like many pedestrian overhead bridges with wheelchair accessible ramps, the riding of active mobility devices is illegal here. You could try, but you won't have a good time with these bumps. You could also get fined or jailed, so I will dismount and push. The play corridor continues, cutting across Bedok Town Park, which has a park connector running through it, but it will not be featured in this video. 
Instead, I'll continue onto a park connector on the north side of this canal, which also forms the other leg of the Siglap Park connector that continues from Kembangan MRT Station. This park connector cuts right through the precinct of Bedok Reservoir Garden, built between 1980 and 1984, as part of the 7th neighbourhood of Bedok New Town. Note that while there's a cycling path running to my right, I will not be travelling on it, because it requires travelling on a windy wheelchair ramp on the way to Bedok Reservoir Road, which is a lot less convenient when compared to this park connector. Pardon me as I make a brief detour to a not very good cycling path along 739 to 746 Bedok Reservoir Road, which forms Reservoir Village, which is the centre of this neighbourhood. Completed quite a bit later in 1985, more attention was paid to the architecture of the buildings here. Pitched roofs and projecting eaves aim to give a rustic look, and the building forms aim to emulate those of Chinatown. Its unique location next to Bedok Reservoir has led to a unique mix of shops, compared to what you get in a typical neighbourhood centre, with cafes and bistros injecting energy to the place, complementing the recreational spaces around the reservoir, which not only have facilities for jogging and cycling, but also bird singing and occasional dragon boating and canoeing. This is where the park connector within Bedok Town Park merges with the footpath, where the Siglap Park connector technically continues. This one doesn't really have any markings on the ground, but occasionally you get some vague references to it being a shared track on printed signs to the side. Anyways, up ahead on the opposite side of the road lies four private condominium projects, Waterfront Owl, Waterfront Go, Waterfront Waves and Waterfront Key which are all built to exploit the waterfront views that their site location provides since having a waterfront view is quite an in thing in Singapore. These private projects were only possible due to the demolition of 726-738 to Bedok Reservoir Road, which was a housing and urban development company estate by the name of Reservoir View, with plenty of low-rise executive apartments and executive maisonettes. The demolition happened shortly after the privatisation of the Reservoir View in 2002. Here, I make a turn onto Bedok North Avenue 3 and transition from the Siglap to the Bedok Park connector, which connects to the Bedok Reservoir MRT station. Though the pathways here are unfortunately very narrow, due to the need to accommodate high car volumes trying to enter the PIE by Bedok Reservoir flyover up ahead. At the MRT station, the park connector turns leftwards as it follows the canal which we passed earlier along Bedok Town Park. It flanks Longville, comprising of 761 to 774 Bedok Reservoir Road, a long public housing precinct on the northeastern edge of Bedok. There's a brief interruption to the park connector as I cross Bedok Reservoir View at quite a wide point around this roundabout, 
but otherwise the ride here is pretty tranquil. My only criticism of this park connector is the way it meets Sungai Bedok up ahead. Because there are no bridges across that canal, and because the park connector leads to a dead end on Bedok's side, I'll have to make a nasty detour back to Bedok Reservoir Road, so that I can cross over to the Tampanese side of the canal, where there's an overhead bridge across the PIE to a different section of the park connector that quite nearly connects to Tanah Merah MRT Station. This missing link is just one tiny detail which prevents this park connector from reaching its fullest potential as an excellent commutable route. The detour is also not very pleasant because of construction works that are currently ongoing to finish up neighborhood 9 of Tampanese. In the year 2024, the detour is long, so I will just briefly stop talking so that you can have a proper sensory experience of the sights and sound that you get traveling along here. After passing the Tampanese Green Emirate and Green Opal precincts, I meet the Pan Island Expressway, where once again, I have to dismount and push my bike up and down a pedestrian overhead bridge. This is a significant stumbling block for the so-called Eastern Corridor, a key route in the park connector network linking Passeries and East Coast Parks. To be fair to M Parks, this was one of the earliest park connectors to be built in Singapore dating back to the year 2000, and an overhead bridge like this might have been considered a continuous route at that time. However, since the bridge is now deemed too narrow to be cycled on, I will hope to see works being done to strengthen the link by either making the bridge wider or building a tunnel instead, like what is being done to the Bishan to City Link along the Kalang Park connector. This will have great potential in improving the cycling connectivity here.
The Bedok Park connector continues. Not much interesting here, as I'm now in an industrial area east of Bedok, though the park connector would briefly make a detour to connect to this intersection along Bedok North Avenue 4, which we were at earlier. The park connector here is wide and smooth, very conducive for cycling, but it's not easy to assess for industrial workers in the vicinity. Given the presence of impermeable industrial buildings like East Link to my left, occupying huge land lots that are fronted by fences, it will in fact be 550 meters between the two access points along this stretch of the park connector. Much as park connectors are designed to be well connected with public housing, I would like to see greater integration in the case of park connectors fronting industrial buildings, allowing true access for industrial workers so that they can use such a great potential trunk cycling route. Here, I cross Upper Changi Road, the main route to the east of Singapore back in the day before the development of modern Bedok caused much of it to be demolished. Again, we have many industrial buildings, and behind the fences, you can even see bikes used by the workers here, likely to get to Tanamera MRT Station further south. But once again, the workers here do not have direct access to the park connector due to the lack of openings along these fences thus necessitating them to take a windier, longer route to get to wherever they want to go. At Upper Changi Road East, my bike briefly got stuck and dangerously close to rolling backwards as I failed to have enough momentum to climb up this steep slope on a bridge across Sungai Berdo. Once I managed to get moving though, I encountered a dodgy and windy cycle path along Upper Changi Road East. It's no good for any significant volume of cyclists and this is the kind of path which I do not like to see counting towards the 1,300km target by 2030. These metallic railings also narrow the clear wave of the path as I have to make sure my handlebars do not come into contact with them, which could lead to issues if a bicycle in the opposite direction travels by right now. Such railings probably should be removed. Crossing Bedok Road, the cycling path ends as I approach the work site for the new platform to be built at Tanamera Station. I would therefore have to make a long detour around the construction site, through some dingy looking enclosed paths, and as I do that, I will give my closing thoughts on the cycling network of Bedok. Overall, you can probably sense that the cycling network here isn't very cohesive. Many times the cycling path is positioned in a way which makes no sense to the footpath 
fragmenting the pedestrian realm when it interfaces with a plaza near a neighborhood center. In its original design, the pub designers also appear to give up a little too easily whenever a little obstacle comes their way, be it a bus stop or some adjacent development. Cycling paths would suddenly narrow into shared paths or even footpaths. Fortunately, the paths aren't left static as they are. Rather, they are iteratively and dynamically improved upon. Bus stop bypasses are being built, and narrow paths are getting widened. Hopefully, in a few years, the cycling and shared paths here will get more cohesive and continuous, which will make this town more enjoyable to cycle along. As I approach Tanamara Station, do leave your thoughts on the cycling network here, and feel free to subscribe and hit the notification bell if you haven't done so. You can also support me using the super thanks function of YouTube. This is Transit Evolution, signing off. Thank you.